The life of a working-class Edwardian was precarious and losing your job was an ever-present fear. If you found yourself out of work and relying on, at best, a casual income, then you had better hope you had savings, or else you would have to trust to luck and the generosity of your neighbours. Men had families to keep, and insecure work meant hungry children and ill health. There was little state support. Times were changing, but it was still difficult to make ends meet, even with charitable money from the parish or free school meals for your children, if you could convince the authorities your circumstances warranted assistance. To keep a roof over your head, rent needed to be paid, and fuel was a constant necessity, so families often struggled with less food, hoping to charity and the chance of a steady job. In 1909, Maud Pember Reeves, a social reformer, initiated a study through the Fabian Women's Group into the domestic lives of working-class families living on around a pound, or 20 shillings, a week. In this video you will discover her investigations into families who found their breadwinner out of work and find out how they managed, either through savings, thrift, the charity of neighbours, or sheer lack of food, to pay the rent and stave off starvation until employment could be found once more. You can discover more about the lives of working-class Edwardians by checking out videos in my dedicated playlist, link in description, or the channel page. Before we move on, please consider clicking the subscribe button for more content like this. If you find this video interesting, I would really appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up and share it widely with friends and family. Please check out the description to see how you can support the channel and the content we make. If the poor were not improvident, they would hardly dare to live their lives at all. There is no security for them. Any work which they do may stop at a week's notice. Much work may be, and is, stopped with no notice of any kind. The man is paid daily, and one evening he is paid as usual, but told that he will not be needed again. Such a system breeds improvidence, and if casual labour and daily paid labour are necessary to society, then society must excuse the faults which are the obvious outcome of such a system. There is a large class of people who get less than 18 shillings a week because they get irregular work. There is also a class of people who get a regular wage which does not rise above 18 shillings. They get 14 or 15 shillings, and are generally supposed to be doing a boy's job. Men sometimes answer the advertisement for a boy's place and take it rather than go unemployed altogether. The firms who pay by the day often have men receiving three shillings or three shillings sixpence a day and doing three days a week. In many ways it is possible for a man to get less than eighteen shillings a week. He need not be a drunkard or a slacker. He may have been ill and lost his regular job. His employer may have sold the business. The works on which he was employed may suddenly finish. He finds himself out of work and, having no money in hand, he is forced to take anything he can get in order to keep his children from the workhouse. It has been possible to follow the fortunes of a certain number of cases who, for one or other of these reasons, fell out of work. Their subsequent struggles afford material with which to probe the mystery of how such people manage. Mr. I, bottle washer, out of work through illness. Wife earned what she could, wages eighteen shillings, when in work, one child born and alive. When Mr. I could earn again, his back rent amounted to fifteen shillings. He found work in the north of London, he living south of Kennington Park. He walked to and from his work every day, refusing to move because he and his wife were known in Kennington, and rather than see them go into the house, their friends would help them through a bad spell. Mr. J, a carter out of work through illness, 
took out an organ when well enough to push it. Wages, eighteen shillings, when in work. Six children born, all living. Those children who were of school age, in these families, were fed once a day for five days a week, during term time. None of the children were earning. The women were extremely clean, and, as far as their wretched means would allow, were good managers. It is impossible to lay out to advantage money which comes in spasmodically and belated so that some urgent need must be attended to, with each penny as it is earned. After a certain point of starvation, food must come first, though before that point is reached, it is extraordinary how often rent seems to be made a first charge on wages. Mr. V worked for a relative who was in business in a very small way. For driving a little one-horse cart, his usual wage was only eighteen shillings, and when the business fell off, Mr. V found himself getting three days a week instead of six. Later on, he got half-days and odd days, which only produced a few shillings, all told. He tried on off-days to get odd jobs of any sort. Four children had been born, of whom two were living. January 12th to January 19th, 1910. He earned eight shillings, two pence. Friendly neighbours gave a little bread, and Mr. V had some meals at a cabman's shelter in return for calling drivers when fares wanted them. On January 27th, he opened the cab door for a lady who gave him two pence. The police were watching him, and he was arrested for begging. The visitor was unable to see the charge sheet and speak in his favour. He was a week on remand and three days in prison. Again, neighbours came to the rescue. His wife borrowed five shillings from sympathetic neighbours, and she received broken bread and several cups of tea. When Mr. V came out of prison, he managed to earn seven shillings ten and a half pence. The rent had fallen four shillings into arrears, and Mrs. V still owed the five shillings borrowed when her husband went into prison. Mr. O, a carpenter working in a theatre and earning thirty shillings, lost his job because his foreman quarrelled with the management and went out taking all his men. Mr. O got taken on as extra hand in another theatre and was paid two shillings a performance. Out of his fourteen shillings he allowed his wife thirteen shillings. Mrs. O, being landlady of their house, was responsible for sixteen shillings a week in rent. Two lodgers paid six shillings and four shillings for two rooms, and one room respectively. Three children had been born, of whom two were alive. After rent and fuel, from just four to five shillings a week remained for food, this week Mrs. O was prematurely confined of twins. Both died, and the case was automatically concluded. When Mrs. O recovered, she found a place as assistant dresser in a theatre. Her two boys were taken care of by their grandmother, and the household struggled back to something like its previous income. Mr. Yu, who lost his work because his employer wound up the business, was a steady, well-educated man. He was obliged to do odd jobs between long tramps to find a fresh billet. There were five children born, all living, but very delicate. Mrs. Yu had managed by dint of extraordinary and penurious thrift to save one pound, nineteen shillings, eight and a quarter pence when the crash came. Mrs. Yu managed to do on twenty-two shillings, nine and three-quarter pence, whereby she saved nine pence and spent nine shillings, two and a quarter pence upon food, which means an average all round, the family of one shilling, three and a quarter pence per week, or two and a quarter pence a day. Mr. Yu took no fixed sum for his food. His wife did the best she could for him, and thought it cost her about four pence a day, but was not sure. Over the following month, 
and with Mr. Yu's fluctuating income, spending on food varied between seven and just under ten shillings a week, and paying for rent and fuel, the savings fund sank. Terror of using up the fund completely kept Mrs. Yu spending an average, or round the family, of under one shilling a week for many weeks. Though the earnings increased again slowly, and the fund mounted by pennies and sixpences to one pound six shillings. Then the baby was a year old, and the case came to an end. Mr. Yu eventually got work again at a very low but regular wage. During this time of unemployment, two of the three children of school age were fed at school for one term. The care committee of the school to which the other child went did not consider the case bad enough, and the two who did get fed were only received after weeks of application. The mother's very virtues told against her. Her rooms were spotless, the decent furniture, the tidy clothes of better days inclined the school visitor to believe that food could be forthcoming, did the mother choose. Mrs. X, a deserted wife with three children, fell out of work owing to a dangerous illness after the birth of her baby. When she recovered sufficiently to work again, the parish relief which she had been receiving in kind during her illness stopped. She took in sewing and did days washing and cleaned doorsteps. She managed food and fuel, and during this difficulty, the baby was receiving six quarts of milk from friends. But she was behind on the rent, and the landlady downstairs was pressing. Eventually she became an office cleaner, at twelve shillings a week. However steady a man may be, however good a worker, he is never exempt from the fear of losing his job from ill health or from other causes which are out of his control. His difficulty in getting into new work is often very great, because new work in his own trade requires time and patience to find. He may have to tramp from one place of business to another, day after day and week after week. His trouble is that if he spends the whole of his time doing this, no money is coming in, and he and his must live. He is therefore forced to take odd jobs, which bring in something, but which spoil his chances of regular work. Numbers of men who have a trade lose it, because they cannot afford the time necessary to find a new job of the same kind as the one they have lost. They are forced to take anything that turns up in order to keep afloat at all. So the friendly foreman, who says, You turn up every morning at seven o'clock, and I'll call for you when I want a hand, finds when he does call several days later that the man is not there. No amount of explaining next day that in order to keep his family he did a day's work on loading a barge or sweeping snow is of avail against the fact that another man has got the job. Meantime, his clothes and his very muscles are depreciating, and work in his own trade becomes almost an impossibility to find in some employments where it is a common custom to give a man two, three, or four days' work a week and pay him by the day, it is demanded that he should turn up every day of the week and wait for his work, or lose the few days he has the chance of getting. The carters in certain well-known West End firms are employed on these terms. In many employments there are a number of extra men who take duty when the regular man has a holiday or fails to appear. These extra men live a life of great poverty and great uncertainty. The work they do may be skilled, and they are bound to keep their hand in, and bound to appear daily in order to secure a few days a week for a wage which would be barely sufficient did they get six full days. The lives of the children of the poor are shortened, 
and the bodies of the children of the poor are stunted and starved on a low wage. And to the insufficiency of a low wage is added the horror that it is never secure.